All right, we can get started, and I think people will uh, start creeping in in the next five, ten minutes here. So thanks for being here for Free Radio. I'm super happy to have Crimson Clad and Maximilian Crimson Clad from Hive and Maximilian from Show Me here to discuss SocialFi, um, which is a pretty interesting topic. Um, unfortunately, we're doing it here on Twitter, which is, you know, as everyone is aware, a Web2 platform. But that's okay. Um, just shows kind of the infancy of things, and uh, you know we're still early in this. So, um, if you haven't been to Free Radio before, it's kind of just an open discussion. Um, we have some questions to facilitate, you know, the topic, but we can kind of just talk openly about things between the speakers. Um, and then we also have a NFT that you can claim for um, participating. Um, so that's going to be on our Twitter as well. So I'll just open it up uh, to Crimson Cloud first, and then Maximilian, just to introduce yourself, um, talk about um, you know what what platform you're working with and what you do there, and maybe a, just a brief introduction uh, of yourself. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me today. And so I will say with the caveat, let me know how my levels are. I've found the quietest place to chat with you guys, but I'm in an airport. So <laughs> it could be bad. Um, my name's Crimson Clad, and I work with a platform called Hive. And Hive is a blockchain that was made for social fi. Honestly, this is our place to shine. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things that right now people probably don't understand a lot of what's happening in Web3 is actually powered by Hive. And uh, so one of my big kind of passion projects is to get out there and let people know that they can take advantage of decentralized services, apps, games, financial, uh, social, in terms of everything from Twitter to streaming to short form, long form content, all built on top of an immutable blockchain that's censorship resistant. Uh, and so that's why I thought, you know, when you reached out for today's talk, that this would be such a great fit. Awesome. That's great. Thank you very much. Glad to have you here. And then uh, we'll just get a brief introduction from Maximilian. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for having me here. Um, just a short and brief intro to myself. So um, my name is Max. Um, I'm working for Hogwarts Labs, which is a Web3 D app incubator based in Singapore, but acting and working globally. And uh, I'm currently based in Europe. And uh, we have currently yeah, two big projects that we're working on. Um, one is called Quest3, which is our own personal Web3 event and Quest platform. Um, we just launched it now in August and already were able to have more than 160,000 users on the platform. And besides that, um, our development team and marketing team was also working on a project called Show Me, um, just like Bazaar mentioned in the beginning. And Show Me is a yeah, Web3 based kind of combination of um, two platforms that are also um, quite famous in the Web2 world. And these two platforms are um, on the one hand Discord and on the other hand Patreon. So what we were trying to create is basically a social media platform that enables all kinds of creators, communities, etc. Um, from, from all kinds of field of crypto to connect with their fan base, their user base, and also to have kind of token gated and NFT gated um, communities there as well. Um, also in order to kind of use incentives and use rewards um, in order to, you know, um, pay creators a fair kind of value for, for what they produce on the page. Perfect. Thank you very much, Maximilian, for the introduction there. Um, yeah, and, you know, for this podcast, we're super happy to be using your platform uh, to issue the NFT for participants uh, that were here today. So that's great. Um, so far, you know, we've, we've enjoyed the platform. So thanks very much for that. Um, so just wanted to kind of take a step back and maybe talk about, like, for, 
especially people maybe from our, um, you know, neck of the woods is, you know, what is social fi? How is it kind of different from social media we have today? And kind of how does this finance aspect fit into it? Um, if someone wants to maybe just give a brief introduction on kind of, you know, where we're at today and, and why this is important. Sure. So Crimson, if you don't mind, I'll just start. Um, so basically, as the name social fi already implies, it's a basically mixture of social media platforms um, and then put those social media platforms on blockchain um, combined with um, financial tools as well. And these tools can not only be used, for example, to, to issue your own token and use it as a, for example, like I said, with, with communities as a um, kind of threshold to to create gated communities, um, but also as a um, kind of tool to support a creator on the platform. And in addition to that, um, these finance tools can also be used to integrate all other kinds of like um, features to the platform, um, whether it is like payments or uh, just some funding, et cetera, et cetera. So, brings a lot of new options um, to the world of social media. And for now, I think we've seen some developments at least, um, but I'm not going to take uh, too much away for, um, from it at the beginning. So I think we'll, we'll talk more about how it has developed so far and what kind of issues we're still facing later on. Is that correct? Yeah, you bet. Sounds good. Yeah, you uh, absolutely knocked that out of the park. Um, you know, one of the most interesting things about the idea of social fi, uh, for me especially, is somebody who has been in what is the burgeoning social fi space for almost five or six years now. Uh, there was a legacy blockchain called Steam, and it was literally created to make a place almost like Reddit, but where you would earn crypto for upvotes. And it was this very sort of beginnings of the idea of a community tied to a financial token reward. Um, and, you know, obviously there's been a lot of evolution over time, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that story. But when we talk about social fi, one of the ideas that I like to try and help newbies understand is finance isn't only about money anymore. And that sounds like a really stupid statement. <laughs> but honestly, one of the biggest things that we forget about being social creatures is that where people gather, marketplaces form. And one of the most important things that we do in a social setting is we exchange value. Now, value isn't always a token. Value isn't always monetary. And so this is such an important thing to kind of remind people is that your social interactions themselves are inherently valuable. The content you create is valuable. Your consumption of content is valuable. The games you play, the people you interact with. All of this has a tie back to money or to tokens or to cryptocurrency, but social fi is really starting to take ownership of being able to transact value fast, free around the world in a decentralized way and having control over basically your ability to do that with no centralized body like a big company or a government stepping in to stop you. And so I think there's a place for companies businesses you know marketing aspects and there's a place for true freedom as well and that's why social fi is so exciting for me because you have a choice to follow it in whatever direction you want be rewarded and transact value here perfect no i think that makes a lot of sense so um you know i guess i want to kind of segue into then what you know, what then is the current problems with social media? Um, why do we kind of need these new systems and why are we looking to upgrade on the existing systems? You know, I think, I think most people understand the, the, the fact is, um, you know, a lot of this, these traditional social media platforms is coming up a lot in the news or, you know, you don't own your own data, you know? Um, so, you know, how are we kind of stepping into a potentially a new system for, you know, not only users, but maybe companies or protocols to kind of take back some of that power? Great. 
sure. I yeah, keep I hoping can... Max will jump in first because then I can I can keep you guys from hearing this elevator ringing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too bad. No worries at all. Yeah, so let me start. The like problems of social media. So um, that being, for example, like you already mentioned, was our. Um, but also, I feel like in my um, point of view, also spending too much time on these platforms, um, and also kind of just like focusing less on the social part, but fo like being used as a kind of, um, I don't know, like being used with my data and the data being used to 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 kind of do marketing in other ways also outside of these pro um, products too and i think yeah like we like we just mentioned here um web3 platforms web3 social cloud platforms um can be used not only to kind of solve these problems and uh, reduce the data and to to almost zero so um, the data being owned by these platforms. So people will be able to be in charge of what kind of data they show. And also um, if these, if like what kind of data can be used publicly. And uh, apart from that, most of the data they have um, will be their own data and they are fully in control of that. And also that in combination with, with NFTs also brings data ownership, um, ownership to, to another level here. And besides something that has been very important to us also at Show Me is um, the interoperability section. So for example, not having to connect new accounts and create new accounts with every platform, but being able to use one or two accounts or wallet addresses um, throughout the whole kind of Web3 ecosystem. And our main mission um, was always to, and it still is um, to, have or an, um, on board and accumulate more users from Web2 worlds um, and kind of to not only ed educate them, but to show them what's possible in, in Web3. And for that, what we need um, are easy connection points. So for example, not only like wallets as a signup option, but also using already known platforms like a Twitter or a Google account to kind of sign in and see what's going on in the first place um, to kind of get to know what's going on. And I think we'll, we'll talk about that later as well. But I think um, especially like now from our point of view, we see that a lot of Web2 giants and Web3 uh, and Web2 social media platforms are also integrating more and more Web3 features, um, not only because they have to, because Web3 is such a fast, um, paced field and growing at a so high speed. Um, but also I feel like um, because they know that at some point um, there will be more and more people being interested in these kind of fields and things and want to look into that and they don't want to be left behind. Um, but I think we'll, we'll share some more on that um, later on. And yeah, Crimson, stage is yours. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, it's it's always interesting to hear sort of the flip side on it because there are so many different either companies or DAOs or, uh, you know, platforms working in this space. And so, I mean, everything you've said there is so, so spot on. Um, but the specific idea of ownership is one of the biggest ones because we kind of forget the roots of cryptocurrency in general and even kind of coming back to where web 2 started um you know many of us are in this space because of cypherpunks and the idea that a truly free internet could not possibly exist without encryption and you know here we are decades later you know i think the original cypherpunk manifesto was written in the 90s um, here we are decades later using encryption for a truly borderless idea of money and value transacted around the web. And now we're building services on top of that. Um, and ownership of data, especially that you touched on, is probably going to be the biggest sort of 
um, battle that we fight from here on out because everybody understands the idea of make content, get paid. Everybody understands the idea of talk to anybody anywhere in the world, send money anywhere in the world. These are all things that people get. But coming from web two, where people are really starting to see the crack show is your data ownership. Or like you also mentioned, that ability to kind of go from app to app easily. The idea of a universal login is fantastic on web two, but the problem becomes you have big companies with varying um, needs in terms of your data, passing it back and forth, selling it to each other, um, you know, lacks security. There's so many ways that it can go wrong in web two and it has. In web three, you're starting to find that not only do you have these wallet addresses, you know, on, on Hive, wallet addresses are human readable. My name is Crimson Clad. You can find me there. You can see me playing Splinterlands in game. You can read my content. You can go to my live streams. You can see me as a block producer. All of those things are tied to my identity because I choose them to be. But even more importantly, that you know when you see that is verified by my keys. I'm the key holder. It's much the same as you know we treat uh, tokens being moved around in a traditional system like Bitcoin. We know the only person that can move those tokens is a key holder. And so all of a sudden the idea of identity in Web3 um, is not just about the ownership of the data that you attach to identity, but a granularity in what you want to attach to that identity. And I think that's going to be so, so important, both for companies and for, you know, grassroots community owned blockchains like Hive as well. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I mean, it's definitely something to get excited about for everyone because there's something there for everyone, right? Whether you're interested about ownership or finance or just, you know, the ability to say and share information with your friends or family or any, anyone in the world and not be censored or have to worry about, um, you know, the information getting stolen, right? So definitely an interesting uh, subject and something that's, you know, going to be huge, I think, in the next, you know, couple of years to five years, um, hopefully as soon as possible, but um, it, it's definitely still in its infancy. So uh, Max, you wanted to say something? Sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add something to what Crimson just mentioned. So I think um, when talking about data ownership, um, it doesn't always mean that you have to, you know, keep everything secret, but you can also use the kind of features that we're working on at the moment for example, also, um, if we look at just uh, Furu Radio today, if we look at the um, proof of attendance NFTs we're kind of giving away here after the call, um, I think we can also use these materials in order to create something. And that's also something that's getting quite big right now called the soul bound tokens, which are basically non-transferable NFTs um, that people can receive for example, through like platforms like now the Twitter spot, um, or also, um, for example, through um, doing all kinds of quests or bounties or participating in on-chain Web3 um, events, etc. And kind of use these materials and uh, the poems you receive in order as a, maybe let's say as a proof um, of attendance and kind of to show um, other people what kind of experiences you've gained or what kind of um, activities you've done, what kind of fields um, you're interesting, uh, interested in or also experienced in. And uh, I think sooner or later, we'll definitely also see projects kind of using these soul bound tokens in order to create and build platforms with um, Web3 kind of CVs and resumes um, out of that. So I think that's also something um, we can definitely expect at some point. That's a great point because humans love gamification. Um, and this is one of those things where, you know, a soul bound token with the idea that you can't have it transferred to you and you can't have it transferred away from you is really the ability to curate what people see of you. 
because you mentioned, you know, data ownership is important in that you can control what you give to adapt to a service, to a chain, uh, and also what the chain shows about you. But it is really interesting because all of our social interactions are curated by ourselves and we can only sort of show the things that we actually do. So the idea of intrinsically tying that to almost like a badge or a notification or like what achievements on Xbox, these are things that we just chase. We love this idea. They're engaging, they're inspiring. Um, and, and even, you know, building these things like on the Hive blockchain, we have something similar. Um, it's this ability to sort of curate a wallet address that reflects, again, the values that you're developing or even in just interacting with in the space. Yeah, another great point. Um, super cool for sure. And I mean, uh, it's it's interesting the idea just to kind of track your achievements, right? Maybe where you've been, what you've accomplished, and even for me, I think the interesting part that I thought about when I first was thinking about SocialFi and uh, you know tying my achievements to my identity is you know maybe how can this be tied to the you know the the real world and maybe places I've been or places I've traveled to or things that I've seen, I can now, you know, potentially have a, a memento of this on the blockchain that I can prove that I've been somewhere, attended some conference, met some people. So it allows you to kind of, you know, in a way kind of track your life and, and maybe what you've accomplished as a person or whether that be, you know, your achievements in the school you know, university degree, whatever the case is. So it's, it's such a vast thing that, uh, you know, a vast part of the ecosystem and where we can definitely go and how it can help to, you know, improve people's lives or, you know, bring more transparency to these kinds of things. So definitely, uh, going to be huge, honestly. Um, it's, it's such a large topic. And I think a lot of people are kind of, I don't want to say sleeping on it, but it's, it's so early on that I don't think a lot of people have kind of grasped the idea of just how huge it's going to be. Right. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a good point here. And uh, like I mentioned previously, um, our main idea was always not only to focus on, on web three itself, but also to have web two ecosystems as a starting point and have like all of the web two users um, as our main focus since those are the users um, using the internet and also um, will be the ones using web three um, any kind of platforms basically in the future so i think yeah we definitely have to count on these areas too and they're really um, like important to us and to everyone in web three and I think not only with the help of um, already like Web2 platforms um, integrating Web3 features, um, we can get to a certain point um, where we have like mass migration. Um, but also I think what we need to do is to educate more people and also kind of give them easier ways to use these platforms and uh, also to kind of show them that crypto and NFTs and generally speaking, Web3 is not only about scams, about rug pulls, but also that there are like so many um, yeah, advantages out there and so many new use cases, whether it is like um, Crimson mentioned, um, global fast and easy and cheap payments, um, or also interoperability um, between many, many different platforms on the Web3 net. And, and also kind of working on new solutions in order to improve um, already existing Web2 platforms. So I think there's still a lot to come, um, but for now, we're still in a stage of early adoption, um, just like Bozar said. So I think there's still, um, yeah, some time to go here and some way to go here. Um, but everybody that's already here on this call today is, is, is yeah, on a, on a good way, I'd say. <laughs> 
You know, it's quite funny that uh, you mentioned specifically traveling, and I know you want to move on to the next question, but it just, I find it very interesting because that was one of the things that drew me to blockchain and actually got me into this whole journey into the crypto space. Um, And I find it such a fascinating idea because for me, it never was about tokens at first. And it's kind of wild to think about that. But there's a service built on top of Hive called PinMapple kind of like pineapple, but with a map in it. And the idea is, is you can drop pins on the map to places you've been, and that's logged against the blockchain. It's there forever. And you can be looked up if people want to search places you've been. But one of the other interesting things you can do is you can then go to a place, look at the pins that are there, follow those pins to the content that is connected to it. And so it's almost like a live Google Maps full of other people's posts, reviews, content. And, you know, it's so simple when we always say, oh, you know, the apps that we see created first on, you know, any new disruptive technology are iterations of the one that came before. And it's the truth because specifically Max is saying, hey, we need to educate people. We need to make easy entry points. And one of the biggest things that I think is so important about something like a community blockchain like Hive or like a specific goal oriented company, like what you guys are doing is that there are a lot of entry points that we can recreate but with more and better sort of value propositions. Um, Because from that idea of I'm going to share my travel photos became, oh, I can be rewarded for my travel photos, became, oh, what can I spend these tokens on? Oh, I can go buy packs of NFT cards and I can play Splinterlands. Oh, when I go to Splinterlands, I can earn tokens that I can then take over to Leo Finance and Cubdefy and I can start trading. All of these things were not on my radar when I started out. I just wanted to do what I was doing on Facebook, but it spiraled out of control. And I'm now sort of in talks like this every day, you know, letting people know the opportunities that are available to them. And I'm also doing things like block production. It's a fascinating journey. And so it's so important that we create these entry points, but it's also really important to kind of see that social fi specifically is absolutely a gateway to the wider crypto world. Somebody may not know how to work with a wallet or transfer a token, but they do know how to write a tweet or they do know how to share a photo. And so this is sort of that common bit of the human experience that can be tied back to value that is going to be what kind of really brings people into this space. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And um, I mean, that's, I think people should understand the value of it now, if they didn't already. And, you know, that, that kind of leads me into the question I really wanted to ask uh, for a long time, which is, you know, um, what kind of social media platforms exist today? Um, Crimson, I, it sounds like you guys have so many products. I want to kind of hear a bit about, you know, what you guys are building. Um, it seems you could, you have a, you know, a swath of tools available for Web3. So, um, you know, how can people really get involved now if they're excited about taking this journey into SocialFi? That's a really good question. Um, one of the easiest ways to do it with the Hive blockchain would be to go to hive.io and check out there's a page that talks about the ecosystem. But one of sort of the biggest kind of things to remember is that, you know, all of the benefits that come with the Hive blockchain, it's open source code, it is a community run blockchain, there is no founder, it's grassroots from everything to the marketing and beyond. And yet here we are, you know, battle tested, we've survived a community fork that was a response to a 51% attack on the original blockchain. We're the only fork that has ever outperformed its predecessor since, you know, the beginning of the blockchain. There's so many reasons why Hive kind of exemplifies the idea of decentralization to a T. But what comes next, of course, is then individual businesses, individual users building on top of Hive. And, 
it really kind of comes down to what do you do on the internet now that you want to be better? <laughs> and it's such a silly way of looking at it, but if you spend the bulk of your day writing content or watching YouTube videos, well, then you should probably go check out Peak D or Ecency, which are both long form content platforms, or you can go watch videos on ThreeSpeak. These are places that combine that sort of magical, I don't, I don't know what, intercept point of ownership and identity, monetization, community, tokens, and then also sort of the idea of a social forum. But there are plenty of people around the blockchain who have no interest in that and they're solely financially driven and there are a multitude of ways to get into that space. There are games. And so the nice thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind is that the Hive blockchain has a lot of connection points and I might even actually kind of reach out to Max later because it sounds like there are so many interesting, you know, uh, crossovers in what's happening with what he's working on his company and the great things that they're doing and also what hive can kind of provide infrastructure for but that being said one of the easiest places to get started would be something like a blog space like peak d or Ecency. And, and I'll share some of these links maybe down below in the comments of this space afterwards, um, because accounts can be made for free. But when we think about them as accounts, they're actually wallet addresses. Your wallet address is human readable. It's a name. It's something that you choose, but it becomes sort of the entry point to the ecosystem. And whether that is literally just trading on something like tribal decks, which is a, an open source, a, you know, non-custodial option for tokens built on a layer two of Hive, or whether you just want to play a card game and you go over to Splinterlands and you actually sign up using a wallet from another blockchain, like maybe Wax or, you know, uh, one of the other options that's out there. It's fascinating to me, especially because I can see so many businesses and developers are starting to take a look at what their options are. What is a great base layer to do what I was going to do anyways on? why wouldn't I use something that allows me to take advantage of free transactions and that allows my users to feel more in control? And I'll, I'll stop here so we can let poor Max talk. But one thing that I do want to highlight, and, and we probably will come up to this, is that if you get deplatformed from any game, from any social site, from anywhere, the problem isn't so much that you've been deplatformed. Uh, you know, a, a company can choose to do that, but you've lost everything you've already done. And that trail of history and that trail of ownership of your own actions is so important. And it's one of my favorite things about blockchain in general and about Hive specifically, is that should you, for whatever reason, get blocked from one front end, you can move to another and pick up where you left off. You don't lose the friends you've made, the connections that you have, the community that you've built, or the things that you've created. And worse comes to worse, if you need to, you can build on top of the blockchain using that information and show it in any way you choose, in any form granularly. And that's huge for an individual wanting to get started, but it's also huge for a business looking to take advantage of features that, you know, are efficient and that come with a baked in user base. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with Crimson here on a lot of points, um, a lot of good things mentioned, definitely. And uh, like she said, um, it, there's not only like a couple of few projects out there, but it actually depends on what you're looking for. And everything that you've known so far from Web2, um, whether it is LinkedIn or Twitter or um, Medium, etc., there is also a Web3 adoption or a Web3 version of this, but maybe with a better solution or a better way of, of working things out. And also with like also all the features integrated, whether it is like um, DeFi features or uh, just interoperability or data science, um, doesn't matter. Um, but just a couple of um, projects that I want to mention, um, of course, besides ourselves, um, which is like um, Show Me is kind of mixture, like I said in the beginning, 
of Discord and Patreon. Um, but besides that, um, there are a lot of cool projects out there. Also, a couple of our clients. Um, so one of them being Mira, for example. Um, very interesting one. Um, it's an online publishing platform um, pushing the media industry into the far reaches of Web3. And with Mira, you log in with Ethereum, for example, and store your writing on Arweave, um, which is a decentralized storage network. And you can mint your posts as collectibles, um, collect all kinds of crypto subscription payments, and set up, uh, for example, also a um, decentralized autonomous organization of DAO. And you can also even embed um, NFTs within your posts. So that's also something that's possible here. And then um, I've just recently made a new client um, here and they're called Orb. And Orb is, um, I think in their own words, um, the best place to network with Web3 working professionals. So basically what they're doing is they're building a Web3 decentralized LinkedIn. So it's a social media app with an end-to-end -end, um, on-chain credibility system which basically means that you can create your decentralized professional profile and build on-chain credibility with things I mentioned before. For example, by linking various NFTs or POAPs to your experience, education, uh, skills, and um, projects you've been working on. And additionally, what you can also do with it is, for example, to post all your thoughts on-chain, just like on LinkedIn, and connect with Web3 people and build your own community and kind of also use these communities um, outside of the platform and on other platforms, just like Crimson, uh, Crimson, Crimson said before, sorry. And uh, in addition to that, um, you'll also have like all kinds of features to, to explore Web3 jobs, um, connect with loads and loads of different um, new projects. And I think, yeah, that's also, um, something that's pretty cool um, on here and besides that yeah I mean there's there's basically nothing you can't find um, and there are so so many more pro projects out there um, that also have like new ideas and bring new ideas to, to um, social media and also kind of want to revo revolutionize the whole scene so I think the best thing to do is probably just get in there and do some of your own research and uh, start exploring and you'll find a lot of really, really cool things out there um, to work with. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of great platforms to check out. I mean, personally, myself, I haven't been too much into the social fi stuff um, since kind of the early days, you know, when Steam, it was still around. I sometimes go and publish aux as well and just kind of check out articles or things going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, personally, as I see it, we're still very much in the infancy. There doesn't seem to be, um, at least that I'm aware of like a, a platform that's kind of overarching everything else. It's kind of taken over, you know, like Facebook is for, you know, friends and stuff. Twitter is for, you know, providing small updates for protocols or, that kind of thing. Um, so it's very kind of going to be interesting to see how things develop. And, you know, does this, because I guess we're so early, does this create any problems with adoption with maybe attracting people to the platform? Or how can or, or what kind of what other issues are there going to be when it comes to bring people to socialify to web three? Is it going to be kind of the idea that someone has to create a wallet, maybe attach a DID to that or decentralized identity, is that maybe going to be too confusing? Or how do we really see things developing? Do Does the interface, I guess, have to become so simple to use that people you know, may not even know that they're attaching this information to a, a decentralized ID to kind of spur adoption or how, you know how do we see things developing in this regard in terms of lowering the barriers to entry and what those barriers might be yeah so i think you already mentioned a couple of good things here so i think first of all designing an ui user interface that is very very simple is is one good thing to do um also for example like you said to make 
people feel like they're already familiar with the projects or products they're using and not really knowing, oh, this is actually blockchain and there's so much more behind that, um, which kind of could lead to a way of thinking and a way of not being afraid of the technology and kind of start engaging right away and seeing what's going on. Um, like you said also, um, right now in SocialFi, there is like no one big project. And from our point of view, what we are always trying to do, not only now in the SocialFi field, but in all kinds of fields we're working in, in Web3, is that it's important also to, to build with others, to build together and kind of find better solution and not be the, the one big project um, that strives, but also to kind of, yeah, you know, build something together. And the, the, the community part um, from our point of view is the part that social media um, is actually, yeah, tr missing at some, at some point. So I think social media doesn't really come up to, to its worth or its name anymore in, in most cases. So yeah, that's something um, we're still trying to, to focus on. And like you said, um, definitely the, the focus on Web2 um, platforms will be important. And in addition to that, what we still have to do is um, we'll still have to wait a little bit in order to have more people being familiar with, with the platforms, with the technology, and also, you know, kind of moving um, the, these people from, from Twitter, for example, um, all these KOLs or, or influencers to, to our new platforms um, in order to get some reach and, you know, get some more views on, on what we're doing. So, so the public also knows more about it and knows that there's more to it um, than just high volatility, et cetera, with tokens, um, which in most cases in social fi um, is, is in no correlation or, or in no relation anyways. Um, but I think, yeah, so for example, with, with our platform, what we've seen so far is that, especially now in the last couple of months, um, there are not as many um, big creators yet in the field. So that's also something that still has to develop. And I think once this gets going, also same with, with the development of Web2 projects back in the days and the first kind of influencers and KOLs um, arising, um, I think that also made a big change to the development of these platforms. And I think that's also something that um, Web3 social networks um, would need in order to grow even faster in the future. I love that highlighting of building together because for me, it's quite funny uh, coming from a corporate world in my own background, but then obviously operating in you now, you know, now this completely non-corporate structure in, in the decentralized web. Um, it's so important to me to see competition, but not in the way that we think of competition in the corporate world. I love the idea of similar services being built on the same blockchain or interconnectedness between base layers, between these same services, because it doesn't necessarily have to be cutthroat competition. One of my favorite things that has kind of arisen in this space, and, and part of this is because of the rise of DAOs and funding mechanisms, is collaborative competition, building on top of open source code, you know, um, it, taking advantage of the fact that you can indeed contribute to an app that you love or make suggestions or even take it and fork it and rebuild it and do something new right alongside it is, is such a, an interesting idea in this space. And so you will have companies who are traditionally corporate structured that use that in their own financial models and, and sort of govern the way that they're going to bring users to the Web3 space. But the reality is, is once the users are here, they'll get to choose where they go. So it's still beneficial whether you take that kind of route of onboarding businesses and onboarding influencers and creating familiar dApps as, you know, sort of some of the uh, less obvious things that are, are available to us. But 
You know, Max covered off so much of this question that I, I kind of want to pick out one thing that you said right at the very sort of start, um, Blazer, was that uh, what are what are some of like the hardest stumbling blocks to overcome? And one thing that I can say is working in a space like Hive is very interesting because, of course, again, there is no corporate controlling structure and there is no singular entity that owns or runs the chain. And so there's kind of two big problems that I can see from Hive and beyond. And one is grassroots marketing can be hard when you are not a company getting the word out because you don't necessarily have a specific brand isn't the right word but you don't necessarily have a whole department dedicated to you know hyping things up things go a little more slowly but what i've discovered is they're incredibly effective because you start getting person to person network effects and it becomes less about let me tell you about the hive blockchain and more about i'm using this great app and i want you to join me come people bring their friends and once their friends enter the space they start exploring naturally the things that they're interested in, which is why these kind of diverse interconnected ecosystems make so much sense. But the big one and, and the one that is going to have to keep being tackled is personal responsibility. Now, obviously we all have this in all things day to day, but specifically the idea of tokens and money being tied to your own ownership and your own responsibility to keep it safe. That's tricky. And, and you know, Max has touched on this on a couple questions now is people inherently think of anything adjacent to crypto as scam, rug pull, put my money in, it's gone. I don't understand what happened. I'm ruined. It, it's a difficult sort of mentality because it's so sensational and it's so easy to get people to fear something. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I think Hive does really well, but that still is a bit of a stumbling block is protecting users via different mechanisms. Hive has a, t a tiered key system, which sounds really crazy, but basically what it means is you can use just enough authority to take an action as you need to. And that means while you're playing games, you can use a key that never touches your finances or while you're blogging the same idea idea, or you can send a memo using a specific key that will never interact with your finances. There are a number of features and, you know, I'd love to highlight them here. Things like locking up um, tokens in short savings for 20% APR, you know, that's something that people understand because they're used to legacy banks. What they're not used to is the ability to then take things out of savings and use them right away without permission. Um, but it really does represent a space that comes with a lot of education on our part because people are scared. One of the reasons that banks exist in you know traditional finance the way they do is because people do trade off, um, I guess, their own ability to act for perceived safety. Now, obviously, everybody here knows because you're, you know, crypto centric, you know that big banks and big corporate structures inherently aren't always safe and you've traded away rights for no real benefit. But there is sort of a happy meeting place and, and we're starting to see this, especially in the Hive ecosystem a lot. And I know it's the same around other blockchains where dApps have started creating light accounts, you know, on Leo Finance, which is a, an basically a financial front end where people chat about, you know, regular fiat to crypto to stocks to whatever, they have the ability to log in using something like Twitter and start posting onto the Hive blockchain and potentially earning or creating their way towards a full Hive wallet. That's a really good opportunity. Um, same things like Splinterlands, they've had to kind of look into this because people want to start gaming. They jump in just knowing it's a card game and not realizing the blockchain aspect of it. And so Splinterlands has started doing things like actually helping people with custody of keys and, you know, being sort of that middleman. And eventually when somebody starts realizing the wider ecosystem that's unlocked by this wallet that they've been using to play a card game, they can then take control of their own keys and move away from that custody. And I think that sort of, uh, that help with security is going to be such a big, 
big part of onboarding people into this space because there's just so much fear to try and work them through. But people are so excited when they finally do take control and have the ability to be fully uh, fully in ownership of everything from data to identity to verified connections to tokens. I think you guys both hit the nail on the head there. Um, yeah, and I mean, just to kind of go back a little bit to the collaboration part, I think that's kind of why a lot of people, you know, have gotten into this space or are interested in it because of the open collaboration. I mean, if you've ever been to like a real life event as well, um, you know, one of the Ethereum events or DevCon or whatever, everyone is very open and sharing. And it's definitely like a, a community that's different from what you're traditionally, you know, uh, maybe used to, right? And it's totally awesome to be part of this community. So, you know, super glad that kind of everyone's on the same page in that regard and super interested to see how things expand and hopefully we can, you know, continue to bring people in with this new kind of thinking and idea that you don't have to be against someone you can collaborate and it helps kind of everyone achieve the goals that they want to achieve. Um, so I guess I'll just end with one final question here, which is around, you know, do we have to be scared of these web two platforms? Do we have to worry about maybe Twitter, or Facebook deciding, okay, well, we want to take into consideration the social fi aspects and maybe them co coming into the space and bullying and trying to change the way things are, or do we just, you know, keep on going the rover going and, and maybe, you know, hope that people will realize, you know, maybe they're doing things different than what they say, or, you know, maybe this is good for the whole ecosystem or, you know, where do we see the future of, of social media and social fi and, you know, are these web two protocols going to be a speed bump or something that we, we hope that they're going to continue to adopt these ideas. I think we might have lost Crimson here, but. Oh, maybe she's already on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go there morning early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, anyways, I'm happy to to kind of answer the last question. Um, yeah, so basically you mentioned a lot of good things um, like before, and I think I don't want to be, um, you know, the one saying, okay, Web2, platforms it's the other way around and web 2 platforms are the ones that have to be frightened um, of web 3 um, that's not the case um, we all know that these platforms you know they have the resources they have the materials the people to kind of get things um, moving quickly and um, I do think especially because like if I talk to my friends over at um, polygon like the polygon team um, they've been working with um, Facebook and Meta for, for quite a long time now. And uh, yeah, I think they have big plans in mind. And even though it maybe doesn't show yet, and even though like if we look at uh, Facebook, if you look at Instagram or, or Twitter, and we don't see that big of an adoption of features yet, um, but still these platforms have these things in mind and they also realize that Web3 is something um, to not joke about and to take seriously. Um, and also an ecosystem that's growing at a very, very fast pace. And also, I think something also Crimson mentioned before is the reason for that um, is often, especially like, the, 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 this is the way I see it, is because Web3 is kind of different to usual like corporate structures as we're used to them. So it's much more chill and uh, people still get stuff um, done. And also I think like even, even now with all the platforms that we're already using um, socially wise, um, we get things done even quicker than, than um, usual corporate firms would do it, I think. And also it kind of gives us the, the opportunity to work globally and make more like also payments or also exchange of information, data, et cetera, at a very, very quick um, pace. 
yeah, I think in addition to that, just to focus on on the future now, we'll definitely see um, the big firms uh, moving in the Web3, into the Web3 kind of ecosystem and direction. And um, yeah, also to kind of not lose their clients, not lose their users um, um, that are maybe planning to migrate to, to um, Web2, uh, Web3 platforms, sorry. And uh, for us, I think it's just uh, important to remain focused on our projects and remain focused on, you know, what else is going to be developed. For example, um, like we talked also about um, soulbound tokens. So maybe this is also something um, we can integrate. And the great thing about um, Web3 and like um, crypto in generally and, and blockchain is that the features that you have on one platform are not limited. So for example, if you have one platform, but you'd wish to have, you know, a couple of other platforms features um, integrated, um, you can also do that and create your own kind of version. Or you could also use the same account you already used for signing up and just move the data to another platform and use it there. So there are a lot of um, good options out there and um, I'm definitely looking forward to the further development. And now, um, Crimson, the stage is yours one last time. Um, thanks for, for inviting me, by the way. Uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, of course. No problem at all. You provided some amazing thoughts. So Crimson, just the final question was um, around you know, should we be worried about these Web2 platforms kind of entering the space or, you know, are we worried about, like, say, Twitter um, maybe changing the game and, and trying to adopt these with the same idea that they have now? Or are we just going to continue to keep building and, you know, hope that people, you know, give people the option to choose what they want and and kind of there's no worry for the future? Oh, she might be having an issue. Um, you're muted. Oh, perfect. Sorry, I didn't realize you were asking me. Unfortunately, it turns out that Heathrow has a time limit on your connection, <laughs> which I've just learned. <laughs> so sorry about that, guys. Um, no you know, I, I just caught the tail end of sort of uh, the statement, the question there, and, and kind of touching on that some of these big companies should we be worried that they're going to start using blockchain tech? And I mean, this is a whole space in itself to start talking about, to be quite honest. But I, I think the biggest thing is, I suppose we could say yes, in that they already have crazy huge audiences at their disposal. But of course, the second that they start creating something um, in the blockchain space, for it to be truly utilizing blockchain features, it opens it up to other people. They will have to choose a chain, maybe they will create their own layer. And the more sort of constrictions and restrictions they put on it to be able to retain the control they have in Web 2, the less appealing their Web 3 version will be. And so that is going to be a huge balancing act for companies of all sorts that bring their products or their, their services or their relationships to blockchain is how much control can I have in this space? What types of technology can I use to, you know, benefit my business and my users? And where do you balance that with Web3 ideals? Because once people get a taste of what Web3 has to offer, especially when it comes down to personal choice, personal responsibility, ownership, and freedom in all things, it's really hard to give that up. And I think this is going to be one of those sort of vote with your wallet, you know, things, which has a totally different meaning now. Before, vote with your wallet just meant I'm going to walk out of your store and I'm not going to spend money with you. Now, voting with your wallet literally means you can go into an ecosystem and contribute to governance or have an impact on a business or a base layer or, you know, any number of things. And that sort of power in not just ownership, but also decision making and influencing companies and, and having a strong ability to do that on a different level is, I think it's going to change the way companies look at consumers.
Yeah, that's a great point of view, honestly. Um, and it, it, as you mentioned, it's something we could talk about for, for hours and hours. So it is tough to put this within just one hour. Um, but, you know, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, incredibly happy that Crimson and Maximilian were, were able to be here today um, to, to do this discussion, especially Crimson, because I know you're on your way to your flight soon. So thank you very much for making that accommodation. Um, definitely follow Crimson and Maximilian and Show Me and Hive and check out the platforms, use the platforms, um, get involved in Social Fi and Web3 because that's going to be what it, you know allows these companies to continue building, protocols to continue building and kind of develop and push things to the further to make it decentralized, safe, fun and everything. So super glad that everyone came today and I hope you continue to spread the word. Thanks for hosting such an awesome space. And I hope uh, if any of you guys have interest in this or other blockchains or want to get involved, like Glazer just said, shoot me a DM, find us anywhere on the decentralized web. And yeah, even here on web 2.0, because we'd love to help you out. We'd love to find what it is you're passionate about and connect you to it. Yeah, thanks a lot also from my side. It was a pleasure, guys. Really nice talk. And hope you're all having a great rest of the week and start using Web3 tools more and more in the future. Awesome. Thanks again. And uh, don't forget to collect your NFT for the call from Quest3. And we'll see you all at the next one. Thanks again.